Okay. Thanks. So good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Dave Schmoker, KJ9I, Sullivan, Wisconsin. We're going to talk about six meter, 50 megahertz, Earth, Moon, Earth, or Moon Bounce. A uh, preview of what's coming is here. Uh, we'll just talk about where I gained some of my prior experience, just for curiosity's sake, and I'm continuing to learn every day. Uh, then we'll look at my plans that I formulated as I contemplated building uh, what is now my second six meter EME system. Uh, and then, uh, then we'll show pictures, a trip through the construction and, uh, and, and um, all of that. So that's basically what's, uh, what's coming. So this is um, uh, the original EME array that I constructed. Uh, about 2000 through 2005, this was on the air. I can't get fucking go to meeting the work. This is uh, Sullivan, Wisconsin. Okay, this is actually Oconomowoc, a little bit north of my current QTH. This is two high by four wide 2M XP28s by uh, M squared, uh, 50 foot Rowan 25G tower cross boom. Uh, all M squared T braces, M squared antennas, M squared OR2800 azimuth rotor, M squared MT3000 uh, elevation rotor. Uh, so this was the first system. Um, here are some of the details about what was into that. And I know someone earlier was talking about scaffolding. That's exactly what I used to construct this is some scaffolding. I would construct one side and then I would rotate it 180 degrees, construct the other side. It was a very safe way to do things. I really think that was a great way to go. Um, here's my first six meter EME array. It was at the same QTH, a different one than I'm at now, Oconomowoc, which is like seven miles north of where I am now. This was constructed on a Trilon tower it used an OR2800 uh, azimuth rotor, an MT3000 elevation rotor, and four 6M9 KHWs. So uh, also this is an M squared H frame. Everything was M squared. Uh, so this was my first, uh, these were my first real EME arrays. Um, now keep in mind this array for six meter fans was 2001 to 2004. Think back to what was going on on six meters then. WSJT did not yet exist. This was CW for EME. And each QSO try took about 10 to 15 attempts to get one QSO. It was very challenging to say the least. Um, but when it worked, it was really exciting. Uh, so, okay, enough on that. Uh, the prior six meter antennas that I've used, I made a list of them one day. It was a pretty good list. My very first was a M squared 6M 2.5 WLC. That's about a 50 foot boom, older generation single Yagi. Then I put up the four 6M9s. Uh, the next six meter antenna that I tried was C3I, the company's now Directive Systems, they made a 13 element on the 51 foot. Uh, the next one I tried after that was an Inhofe antennas, LFA HZE 10. This is the one with the stock square boom, and um, it's big, it's heavy. Uh, after that, I decided. Uh, I loved the electrical parts of the LFA. Um, I don't care for square booms. I had one, um, I called it the box car. I never could control it, even with a prop pitch rotator in any kind of wind conditions. Uh, so I decided to build my own booms. Uh, the next one after that, I home brewed a, a two inch OD round boom that was 58 feet long, put that up as a single LFA 10. That survived until this last July. Uh, and then my next generation, I, made, I tried to make the booms even stronger for my EME array. And I, again, went back to the design drawing board and I redesigned the booms to be a little bit heavier and uh, heavier duty, stronger. And that's what I've got on the current EME array is those booms that I designed using Kurt Andress's uh, Yagi Stress software. I also have acquired one M 
uh, 6M8GJ that I want to use for travel sometime in the future. And uh, near the end of the talk, you'll see I had a weather event that caused excitement this past summer. It, uh, it took apart my single LFA-10 that I had used for terrestrial, pretty much destroyed it. So I'm in the process of replacing that with a um, LFA-9. All right, so those are the different antennas that, um, that I've used on six meters. Some people talk about moon bounce in California. This is what they think of. I view it a different way, but that's what they do. Uh, okay, and then uh, on the new system that I'm, that I'm devising, I'm envisioning building a new six meter EME system. My initial requirements, I said, okay, I need a very stout tower, about 60 square feet of wind load capability. Rotators, I want full azimuth and elevation capability. Feed line, less than one dB loss at six meters. Capable of legal transmit power. Uh, Pre-amplifier, and I realize there are many different opinions on where slash how you should do this. Uh, I opted for one out of the tower. Uh, and then I have separate transmit and receive feed lines going from the house to the tower. That's uh, LDF 7-50. Uh, line that goes out to the tower. It's one for transmit, one for receive. <clears throat> the vision was, and I was very determined to do this, the original design plan, I wanted an eight, an eight Yagi array of smaller Yagis. And I learned this on two meters. Two high by four wide is what I wanted to do. And I was thinking maybe seven element Yagis, maybe sixes, maybe, you know, and, and at one point I found a design on an eight element Yagi that was really pretty good. I could do lightweight and I really was determined to do this. I got the boom design down to four square feet. I thought, let's do this. Well, everybody I know, my trusted friends in EME were saying, no, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. It'll break. It's, you know, and, and my constraint is I have only a single tower to do this from. I don't have a sidecar. Okay. I'm not a welder. So my constraint was this had to work from a single central tower. And so what Changed my mind is a 90 foot wide cross boom is what I would have had to do to do this. And, um, and, and that stopped me because when I considered the, the, the when I considered that it, 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 and I had people saying, don't do it, do four of four nines, I, I, I decided that was smarter. So 30 meter or 90 foot wide is too much uh, mechanical, not survivable. And so against my outer perfectionist tense tendencies, I switched to the 4.9 classic design. <clears throat> the 4.9s, uh, I wasn't quite happy with that. I tend to be kind of perfectionist. I want, you know what? 4.9s is awesome. I want a little more. I love the 10 element Yagi I'm using. It really plays well. So I went, let's try four of these and see if that would be doable. Uh, that was the plan at this point, separate feed lines, at the time, I had a Link RF IQ Plus EME SDR receiver. That was supposed to be the latest thing since sliced bread. I had one of those. I tried it. Uh, I had and still have an SSB LT6S transverter for six meters. Here's an interesting look at the software in EME. 20 years ago, very little of this existed. We had uh, a tracking program to track the moon. And we had LINRAD, which was audio processing for the CW signals. That's it. That was, that was the entire software. Uh, Moonsked. Uh, so when you look at the software now, I just sat down and made a list of the stuff that I use just for EME. Here it is. It's a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty interesting list of how the game has changed and how software has become integral in an EME system. Uh, the initial plan looked and was built like this. <clears throat> this is my top level system diagram and it shows the, the array over on the upper right and then the dedicated transmit and receive lines. Um, I do run the split transmit and receive lines. This is kind of the classic old school way that you do EME. Um, I also had that behind a JRC JST245, which was my all time favorite HF from six meter radio. But I put a transverter out there behind that because the noise figure of the transverter was far better than the JRC six meter receiver would be. So I used those together for many, many years. Um, and then I have a, a Henry um, 
I'm going to call it a prototype amplifier. Um, it'll do 1500 watts uh, full duty cycle, but I had to overhaul 28 aspects of that amplifier to get it there. It was originally designed for CW SSB, 50% duty cycle. I kind of enjoy working on amplifiers. So that was a multi-year project of, of updating, rebuilding that prototype amplifier into something I can use. Uh, and then to drive that, I use an Elecraft KPA 500 because out of the transverter, you get, you know, 510 watts and the, and the KPA 500 brings that up a little over 100 watts. So uh, that's the system. Over on the right, you can see the rotor controllers. I'm a big fan of the Green Heron controllers and then the computer hardware we'll talk about later. Okay, that is pretty much what I'm using today, except I changed it in one way. Um, I sold all my JRC radios. I had four or five of those JST 245s. Uh, I just got, they got to the point where they were getting old and, and, and I didn't want to deal with, uh, you know, maintaining them. So I, I sold all of them, had an opportunity to do that. At the same time, I picked up a good used K3S. I was uh, shopping the Sherwood list and, and, and it made me believe the K3S is, is near the top of that receiver list. And I, and I put that in the 10 meter data mode behind my LT6S transverter. And I thought, hmm, in theory, that should be a good play. So that's what I'm currently using. Now, a little bit about that LT6S transverter that was also built in the CW days. So when I started getting on the moon, Lance and other people told me my signal would drift after I'd be on transmit for a certain number of seconds. So what I did is I um, contacted the manufacturer's SSB electronic in Germany and they said, no problem, we can update that. So I sent it back to Germany they um, added some TX stability into it and uh, some sort of a, a way they fixed that. And uh, recent testing says that fixed my, my drift problem on JT. So, okay, here's the array pattern. Um, this is the theoretical predicted from EZNEC uh, four of these LFA 10s, okay. Um, VE7BQH Lionel is the guy that does tireless effort calculating um, different parameters on all different types of antennas for EME on every band, including six meters. He is incredibly wise when it comes to making stuff play really well. This is his list and, and worksheet, and it has highlighted the antenna that I have. So it shows the expected GT gain, uh, et cetera. And in a nutshell, there it is. The GT, uh, basically the quality factor or how well you receive the desired EME signal and reject noise and other stuff off the sides, minus 17.7 dB, the forward gain 18.87 dBD in theory. Then I use uh, receive preamplifiers and I have one out there now. These are the ones that are on my short list. And I actually have each of these on hand. I've learned in EME, keep extra preamps in stock because occasionally I have burned them. Uh, but I currently use the LNA 600 by SSB. Uh, that's the current one I'm using. It is a receive only that you have to put your own TR relays around it type of, of unit. And so it makes more work up the tower. Here's what the more work up the tower looks like. This is the tower top detail, uh, including the two uh, TR relays that are in my system. These are what switch me from transmit to receive and back and provide the isolation to protect the LNA. In addition to that, I put transient absorption zeners, the TAZs uh, up here, and I put um, a little RC um, uh, set in front of the LNA to try to protect that LNA from transients, because of course, as a, as a field effect transistor device, it's sensitive and it, it'll fail if it gets a transient it doesn't like. So, uh, so far so good on that. Here's what it looks like when I wired that all up. Uh, not necessarily pretty, but it seems to work. Um, but Are you kidding me? This is the, the TR uh, switching that is at the top of my tower. Um, a pair of TR relays, they're on the upper part of the, 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 you know, the, the box and then the preamp right there. And then my terminal block to access the voltages and currents for testing. And then my um, 
my feed lines. All right. Um, those that do EME understand this. Timing's everything. Um, you've got to have a sequencer that basically puts your, uh, your LNA into bypass and uh, protects it before you, before you hit things with transmit RF. And so uh, many years ago, I bought a couple of Down East Microwave TRS sequencers. I love those things. When I sold my two meter stuff, uh, when we moved to Iowa in 2005, I, um, I sold one of them, but I kept the other one. And that's what I still use on six meters, a TRS by Down East Microwave. Cabling, uh, I'm pretty big on keeping good records. Uh, the cabling going from the house out to the tower has to be correct. Everybody that's built a system like this understands this. This is my way to keep those details straight is good records with the various cables that start in the house and go out to the tower so that when I troubleshoot and et cetera, I can track things. Here are the boxes that I put at the top of the tower. These are basically for troubleshooting. So if I need to troubleshoot something, I just pop the four screws off these boxes and go in and uh, there are terminal blocks in there that allow me test points for my cabling. By the way, these are, um, uh, there's a gentleman in Texas that makes Balance, Balance Designs. These are his boxes. He makes the boxes with those little back plates and he even has a little round bracket. You can, a hose clamp, you can put them around tower legs. So um, that's where that idea came from. On the receive system, boy, the world is changing. We used to do JT65. Um, when we did that, I used multiple receive computers. I learned this from a good friend of mine, unfortunately, he's no longer with us, the late KB8RQ, Gary Crabtree. He was big on two meters and taught me the value of multiple receive computers. Um, this is interesting because Joe Taylor swears that according to theory, there is no difference between any two computers, that they will all decode the same. It can't happen that they decode differently. This is what theory says. All right, what practical testing says is different than that. And Gary convinced me of that and showed me he used to use seven receive computers on his two meter system. I don't know how many people know that, but he had seven receive computers. Uh, five was enough for me to try to keep up with because you're hustling around the radio room when you're trying to operate. But these are the computers that I had at the time we did JT65. And uh, I've got just one of those designated as a transmit computer. The others are all just listening. And I would still put them in transmit mode, but of course their transmit output would do nothing except mute them on transmit period. And then they would receive on, 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 on receive. And I did find sometimes one computer would receive something the other one missed. I did find that, which is why I'm, I'm still a big believer. I mean, I've scaled this back, but that's what I did when we did JT65. I've simplified things since then. Q65, the new mode has gotten significantly more sensitive and I'm aging and can't keep up with all those different receive computers, nor do I wanna maintain all of that. So I've scaled back and I just have two receive computers currently. One of them is my Mac, that's my favorite computer, but I've got another computer that is Windows based and uh, that one um, is connected to SDR console and an AirSpy R2 SDR receiver. So I have the same receive path you can see right here over the upper left split in half. And I send half of that into my conventional receive path, the LT6S transverter behind the, the Elecraft into the Mac. And then I send the other half of that, which is an RF coax cable into the AirSpy. And then I use that to um, feed that into SDR radio um, which you'll see a screenshot of here coming up that goes into the windows PC. And I, and I run both of these when I'm, um, when I'm receiving with Q65. So, okay. In a nutshell, between 2000 and 2020, things have changed in a big way. In 2000, everything was CW. A hundred percent of stuff on six meter EME was all code. Uh, well, of course, actually here I put two meter stuff. On two meters, we had DF2ZC doing a, an email newsletter that came out. The expeditions back in that day ran from fixed schedules. Lionel VE7BQH typically would arrange and run those. You would, if you had a capable two meter station, you would request a time slot with that D expedition and Lionel applied his EME knowledge to make sure that it was a smart time that took good advantage of where you are, you know, relative where your moon is, et cetera. 
and you ran your slot. It was it was a lot different than the HF nets and lists. It was a lot, it, it, it felt a lot more like freestyle operating. It did not feel at all like a list operation. You basically had a time slot that was prearranged and you went on it. And, and, and if you get, if you worked them, good. If you didn't, next guy is up in, you know, 10 minutes or whatever it was. So that was how things worked 20 years ago. Now, look at how EME is now. Nearly 100% of activities on the digital modes. Uh, the web is used to forecast de-expedition activity. Wideband WSJT decoding is possible. Back in the day of CW, you could use LINRAD and basically you could pipe through one, maybe two signals at a time. Uh, and then of course, today we use web pages to coordinate QSO tries. So just kind of an interesting look at how the game has changed across 20 years. For system testing, in the old days, we used to literally send CW echoes at the moon. You would typically send a few letter Vs straight at the moon. You had to shift your RIT on moonrise 150 hertz up to get to hear your own signal. And then when the, of course, as the moon moves up to the uh, the center of its of its rotation, uh, zenith, you're, you're at zero uh, um, Doppler. And then when you come back down to moon set, you're minus 150. You, so you would manually set all that and listen for your echoes. Today, Echo test utility is a pretty sweet tool for making measurements with EME. All right, um, so more details about what, what I plan to build. The new system, as the vision became clear of what I was gonna build for TENS, um, I went for big uh, Heliax phasing lines. Um, I've used LMR cable in the past, it's okay. I like Heliax better. Uh, it just, in my experience, it lasts forever for the most part, and it's just very trouble-free. Then I went with RG393, what, what K9YC would call solenoid coaxial one-to-one -one chokes at the feed points. Uh, my LDF7, one and five eighths coming into the shack. And then the support structure is, um, uh, this goes back to uh, Ken Boston, W9GA, uh, helped me get into EME many, many years ago. And... I don't know, somehow we came across this, this old Coast Guard tower that was sitting in pieces atop a, a rusting school bus. Uh, the tower came from the Lake Michigan shoreline. I believe it was an old Coast Guard tower. I rescued that the old tower pieces, and that became my old two-meter tower. And then I rebuilt that basically to become my current six-meter tower. Rotators for this current system. Uh, like I said, last time I did this, I had all M squared stuff. Um, <laughs> You know, they make good equipment, uh, but I'm a big believer in, uh, in prop pitch rotators. I've just had such excellent, excellent luck with those. So I tasked K7NV with, can you find me an extra large? Because that's what I determined I needed for this, for azimuth. And then um, uh, one of the designs that M squared made for elevation, they did a, they did a sideways OR2800 and they called that an MT5000. I think they only made two of those. K5QE has one of them. The other one, I couldn't track it down, but I thought that's the way I want to do my rotor, something like that. Well, because I was unable to get a hold of one of those, I went, okay, I think what, I think I want to stay with that basic idea. And I tasked K7NV with would you be interested in coming up with a, a small prop pitch driven um, uh, elevation rotator? And I gave him the criteria. Um, Tim N0TB joined in on that effort as we were getting this underway, which was good because that helped Kurt, you know, he built two of these right away when he's building one. Uh, so that's what happened with rotors. Uh, let's see, LNA at the array, uh, and then the TR components, the sequencer and the relays too get good isolation and separation between your transmit and receive. So this is the basics of the high level of the, of the station. Um, <clears throat> for the radio, here's the Elcraft K3S with the transverter above it, and then the rotor controllers there. Uh, I got that into one picture. At the time, when I was doing JT65, I had multiple receive computers. A couple of those ran Linux. The other belief I have is diversify the operating system. I had one Mac. I had two of them running different variants of Linux and I had two of them running Windows, I believe. So I had my five computers and they had different OSs just to try to get maximum decode possibility. Uh, so here are the details on those computers. This I find very interesting. 
I would regularly see that when there was a difference between computers that would decode and some that didn't, the one that out received anything else was my old Windows XP Toughbook laptop. Now, why is that the case? I don't know, but I, I can assure you that computer out heard all of the others numerous times. I don't know if it's how quiet the sound card was. Something was better about that hardware or, and or software that worked better. Um, unfortunately, that computer lacks the horsepower to do Q65, so that computer has been retired. But here's some of the software that tracked the moon back in the day. This is uh, Nova for Windows by W9IP. Um, I could not get this to, to, to install on Windows 10 because uh, it, it was written way back in the XP days, but it's really neat software. Uh, other software, here's Linrad. This was the original stuff. Now, I am not a computer science expert. I'm, uh, I struggle with advanced computer stuff set up like this. I've enlisted help from friends that I work with, et cetera. So setting up Linrad uh, is not for the faint of heart. It's really involved, especially on Linux. Um, and I'll admit I had a lot of help doing that, but when it was set up, it really worked nicely. And of course, Linux, you don't really have to touch it. Once you set it up, it runs long periods. Today, here's the Windows 10 box. That computer is also really good. Uh, this shows PST Rotator over on the left, and it shows uh, the uh, oh Map 65 over on the right. This is the pre-Q65 Map 65. A number of people have tried this Map 65. Um, I have yet to find anybody, and I just wanted to try it to see if I could get it to really sing. And I will tell you, it's deaf in my experience. And that matches the experience of what other people have told me about the six meter version. I, I, I did not decode anything on MAP65 that I didn't get better on my other individual computers. That was just my experience. And I did spend pretty serious time setting this up and working it. Uh, so I, 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 I don't run that right now. Uh, another piece of software that I just really, really love is by the late GM Ford JJJ, uh, David Anderson. He was a moon bounce guy like us, right? He also was a Mac fan. Um, I am too. That's my favorite um, user interface of any computer. And so he wrote the best. Uh, this Moonsked for Linux is also uh, Moonsked for Mac, Moonsked for Windows. It's now freely available. David has passed away, unfortunately, but this is the, the Moonsked for Linux when it was installed on Fedora Core 3 back in the day. Um, it just was very stable and, and worked really well. Uh, this is the moon graph of, of, uh, of Moonsked. And I know there are other tracking programs as well. This is just the one that I've used for many, many years. You know, why do you like that software? I've always used it. I like, you know, kind of that kind of thing. Of course, now we have WSJTX. And um, this is... WSJTX on my Mac, um, and it happens to be running Q65 here. This is probably a little bit small to see, but you can see YL2GD on here, and of course that that rock in the house signal. If you look at the waterfall between uh, 1100 and and like 1300 hertz offset, that's N8JX, who's uh, who's my neighbor. He's like barely across Lake Michigan from me. So when Terry B keys up. <laughs> You get a big signal, okay? That's N8JX, all right? He's another good six meter moon bouncer. All right, we said SDR radio, SDR console is a, is a, is a program that's, uh, that's out there. Um, I love this program. Now, uh, it took me a long time to warm up to SDR stuff. I just, well, I have a health condition that makes it painful to click and do more mousing and keyboarding. So I resisted SDRs for a long time. But the reality is they work better. There are things you can do better on an SDR. You can do noise blanking. That is, I believe, superior on an SDR compared to other platforms. And uh, so here's, here's my implementation. This is AirSpy R2. Uh, Paul N2EME was very helpful in, um, in, uh, in getting this set up. So this is uh, one of the views of, uh, of six meters. And there are different... I know the Flex Radio people have slices. Well, SDR console doesn't have slices, but it has 
something that's kind of sort of similar where you can take band segments and you can put those in various parts of your screen and look at them simultaneously. So uh, that's what you see along the top of the screen here. You'll see on the top left, the CW beacon zone. The next one over to the right is the SSB zone, 50.125. The next one over to the left is the EME zone, 50.190. The next one over to the right of that is number four is, is uh, 50.260. And you can see the, the FT8 stuff and et cetera going the rest of the way across. So it's just kind of interesting to see visually when the band opens. Uh, and yeah, uh, this program is by uh, Simon Brown. Um, wow, uh, it wows me. Um, it's just really good stuff. So uh, if that's interesting to you, great. All right, so let's make sure. All right, yeah. Okay, so now we're all set up. Who are we going to work? All right. Um, there are permanent stations throughout the world on six meters. Um, many, many uh, out there. Uh, a lot of our friends in JA, VK, ZL, uh, there's KG6DX in Guam. There's, I mean, lots of people that live in various places we can work, our, our good friends in Europe, of course. And then there are also uh, a, a lot of people that, not a lot of people, there are a few people that go on expeditions. Uh, this, these folks here, W7GJ, he's the energizer bunny of six meter EME. Uh, Drago, S59A has gone to some places. Bernie and Paul from South Africa have, uh, have traveled and put some places on the air also. So these are some of the folks to keep your eye on if you're interested in seeing expedition activity on six meters. A couple screenshots I wanted to show. This was, these are old JT65, but um, some people said that you can't decode down to minus 32 with JT65. I disagree. This was one of my Linux receive computers and this one was a laptop, believe it or not. So on this day, I just happened to have the receive zone with the towel set in the in the right place for this guy. And even though I could not see a waterfall trace here, it decoded perfectly. Um, this is another look at the other Linux computer that I had set up for JT65. This is when um, 8, 821 EME was active. And uh, this is when, uh, well, this one, I don't know if uh, WA4NJP is on here, but this is when A21EME was calling Ray. So um, this was a look at some of the decoding going on. Here are some decodes. I'm big on keeping screenshots because I love just looking through these and remembering stuff I worked. And then I go, gee, how loud was that person that from this or that place? When Lance was here or there, you know, was that one loud or was it really uh, skin of the teeth? Uh, and, and I look at these screenshots to remind me, uh, you know, what it was like. So uh, I love keeping a Word document where I uh, run around and I keep screenshots. And I, and I know that's kind of anal with documentation, but it's very enjoyable to me. That's also why I was running around like a very busy person with five received computers. I would grab screenshots from those, put them all on one computer and then save them. To, to document a QSO. Here's Tango 77C. A couple of the guys from Italy went over there and put an expedition on. That one was kind of fun to, to work. Here's Lance when he was over in VK9X. Again, this is all JT65 stuff. Now, here's a flashback going back to two meters. This is when WSJT was brand new. Anybody remember JT44? Here it is. This is two meters, not six. But this is two meters uh, ZL7C. And so if you think the software we have now is difficult, take a look at this. This is what you would see on your screen. You would see all this stuff and you had to kind of go fishing in there and say, do I see KJ9I? And I used my green highlighter just to, you know, highlight some of the stuff. But if, as you go fishing in here, you can see the, the classic EME exchange, the calls, the you know, the, the, the calls and O's, the ROs and the triple R's and then the 73's. Actually, I got a 37 at the end of that one. So I guess that one wasn't quite as good as a 73. But anyway, you get the idea. That's what JT44 used to look like. So, okay. So what did I learn from the first experiences? Use high quality components. Mechanical balance is essential, not optional. Good feed line and use contests or G expeditions to try to work new ones. That's what I learned. All right. Um, so at this point, we're going to move into the construction log, I guess I'll say, of the array. And I'm going to go a little faster through some of these because I want to stay on schedule here. 
if anybody has questions and wants to, to, to go back to stuff, we can do that. But I, but I want to respect everybody's time because I understand how busy everybody is. The, the construction phase involves multidisciplinary project management. I forgot how much work it is to do an EME system until I did this one. From 20 years ago, I forgot how much work it is. But now I remember. <laughs> Anybody who's done this recently, you know what I'm talking about. It all starts with the tower. This was my original top section of my old two meter tower. It had, it had Roan thrust bearings in it. It was set up for the OR2800, et cetera. Here's the second section. I always build things, you know, prototype it, get it ready first. I use car jacks to move it around in the yard on two by fours. You can see there was some snow on the ground. That helps an EME system work better. For those of you that aren't used to that snow thing, it works. Okay, uh, this is the first 20 feet. Well, that's great, but the problem with this was now that I'm going to four nines, 20 feet's not tall enough. I need 30 feet. Uh-oh, I don't have the parts to do that. What I did have, luckily, is I had the three legs for the next 10-foot section, and I went, what if I put those three legs like this and figure out the cross pieces myself and have them manufactured? That's what I did. I got this place called Speedy Metals in New Berlin, Wisconsin. They're awesome with cutting whatever metal you need. I ordered up some angle iron. I, I figured out the, I did my best imitation as a mechanical engineer and I figured out the slope of this and I built the rest. I designed and built the rest of those cross members. I drilled them and then I took them into a uh, hot dip galvanizing place in Milwaukee, Acme Galvanizing, and I had it all hot dip galvanized to make it come back like brand new. So, okay, that just gets the tower this far. And then it's like, okay, now I need a concrete base to put in the concrete. How are we gonna do that and make sure it fits and make sure it's level? Well, I got this guy up by Exonia that is a couple miles down the road. The guy is amazing and he can build anything. You just give him a drawing and he does it. I literally transported my tower on his trailer up to his shop and he returned this. This is Randy uh, Pascula. That guy is amazing with machining. You give him a drawing or, or explain what you need, he can build anything. He built all of the difficult parts of my EME system, including this concrete base, which is all welded together. And of course he fit it directly to the tower so that we knew that it would fit when we put it up. It did, it fit perfectly. I hauled it down to Dixon, Illinois because the Milwaukee hot dip galve place doesn't have a dip tank big enough for this. There's a place in Dixon, Illinois, um, hmm, can't think of their name right now, really big galvanizing place there. I hauled this down there, like a week later, they called and said, it's done. It, and it came back looking like brand new. Um, so that's what I did for hot dip galvanizing. Uh, then uh, Randy also took my, my former tower plates. By the way, these tower plates were custom built by Another friend of mine, the late N9JUU, he worked at a place that used to laser cut stainless steel. So he figured out the dimensions on all three of these plates back in the day, designed them, wrote up drawings, and cut them for me. And those plates are what I use to this day. However, I had to cut new holes in them because they needed different stuff. The new bearings that K7NV designed, the new rotator, different holes. So got the drawings from K7NV, gave them to Randy. Randy laser cut these plates and got them to exactly what I needed for the new rotators. Then pour the concrete. I'll spare you the, the details here, but you can kind of see, and all of you that have done this know it's a project. Okay. Um, feed point chokes. Here's what I went with originally. RG393, four and a half turns. Uh, this is one of the earlier Innov antennas designs. That's what I went with originally. And then phasing lines, I build my own. 7 8 heliacs, I put DIN connectors on the one end and I have end males on the other end. I trimmed them to within less than 0.1% of each other. So they were electrically the same length. <clears throat> Power divider, W7GJ has published a design. I, I basically used his design. It, it works rather well. Randy Pascula did all the machining on this, build your own power divider, measured it up, it works. While we were waiting for the concrete to cure, I put the ladder on the side of the tower, starting to get things ready, then start building elements for the Yagi, okay? So 
four Yagis. I color coded each, uh, all the reflectors are red. The driven loops are next. The white is director one. The black tape is director two, et cetera. All the way out, you can see I'm, I'm fortunate to have a heated garage. So some of this stuff that happened in the winter, I'm working in my heated garage. And, uh, and I would go outside only as needed to do the tower stuff, come in for warm up breaks. Then I assembled ya uh, Yagi booms, um, got all the material, had it drilled. Randy did the drilling for me. He's so good with the precise stuff. I do not have a drill press, so I entrusted him with that. He drilled all the holes. Guess what? They all fit together right the first time. Love it. Made it so easy to, to do things well. Then adding elements. Uh, now, this is the part where the original square booms are better. Assembly, easier. Okay, but it's not enough to, to convince me I'm going to do that ever, ever again, because the wind load of those square booms is prohibitive in my experience. So my round booms are a pain to assemble because you literally have to lay the brackets on these and you got to level them and you got to do the spacing of elements. And I'm particular. I set those to the millimeter. I set them exactly to what the dimensions need to be. A little closer up, by the way, these are all homebrewed element clamps. I brought drawings up to Randy Pascula. These are Lexan brackets. And then I use a stainless U-bolt to hold it around the boom, a single stainless U-bolt. Um, one of the ideas Innova Antenna uses, they, they use those stoff pipe clamps, the black things on the sides of the element. Those are a beautiful idea because they dampen vibration that might happen if you get low wind speeds on an aluminum element. Um, I know some people have had problems with some antennas where the elements harden and fall off. This, this eliminates that problem because the the center of these stoff clamps is like a rubbery gasket and it sucks up the vibration. So this was Justin's idea. I just borrowed it. And, uh, um, and Justin sold me the elements and uh, basically was very supportive and helpful as I built my systems. Then, oh, oh, MG, what a story here. Okay, so I received my, in, in, in all this excitement, K7NV is terrific as a mechanical guy. Um, I love the work that he does. He's just such, he's so good with the mechanical stuff. So I get this rotator, I set it up on my workbench. This is the extra large azimuth rotator. I'm looking at this and I'm going, okay, I'm ready. This is good, this is looking nice. I'm checking out the bearings, greasing everything up. And I'm thinking, okay, I think everything's good to go. So a little later, I went to put this in the tower and I'm putting it together and, uh, there was a part that I got on the phone with Kurt and I said, um, your directions say to use this ring. I said, what ring? What are we talking about here? And he's like, well, it's in the box. I said, what do you mean? Well, guess what? Um, the ring that Kurt shipped did not arrive at my QTH. Uh, there was a part, it's, it's now pictured in the upper left. That's a replacement ring that a certain commonly known delivery carrier lost. Um, takes a lot to get me to lose my cool. This, this made it happen. What I believe happened, if you see down right, that box is the one that this was packed in. I think that that ring probably sliced that box open on a fall somewhere within the shipping system. And, it, and, it, and some genius just tossed the thing into the dumpster. Now think about this. This ring is from a World War II aircraft, a B-29. Where are you gonna get another one of those? Luckily, I have good friends. My friend N1DG helped me because he happened to know some people that were kind of high up in FedEx. And believe me, I was, I was uh, making some noise with high levels of FedEx to uh, try to get this made right. They did finally pay a claim back, but it was, um, I wanted the part back. That's what I wanted. Um, the other unfortunate thing I have to admit is I didn't realize that this part was missing till about two weeks after I had the rotator because I got to put this together. And of course, when you let two weeks go by on anything shipped, it's over. If you don't get on it right away, if something's missing or lost. So that was part of the problem here too. And I think the point of shipping uh, updated some things and how they pack things too. So, so several of us learned lessons here, but I was a little touchy after a part from this rotator went missing in action, never to be recovered. Luckily, K7NV made it right. God bless him. He found somehow 
the rotor I had came from, uh, oh, who's the six out in California? AG6 something, the guy that was with a record company. I can't think of his call. Big contest guy out in the West Coast. This apparently he was going to use. He didn't need it. Uh, basically, I ended up buying this rotor. And, uh, and Kurt went and found the other missing ring from some other guy in the Bay Area that had one of these in his basement, and he fixed it up and got it to me. So Kurt made it right. How come I can't turn the slide? Come on, slide. Okay. So next thing, put the rotator in the tower. Test it. Make sure everything runs. This is a 90-pound rotator, by the way, nine zero pounds. A chromoly mast. I had Kurt K7NV do the math on the mechanics of this, and he convinced me that the that the three inch chromoly chromoly mast was sufficient. Uh, N0 TB and I split one of these. We bought a big one from DX Engineering, the full what was it, 22 foot chromoly mast. Tim needed a piece, I needed a piece. We had Randy cut it, and uh, that's what we did for mast. The bearings are all K7NV specified. They're professional. They're um, they've got grease fittings on them. They're really beautiful. I mean, this thing is just um, a well-oiled machine. Uh, I'm very, very pleased with the mechanical aspect. So then the other thing I did is I needed a cross boom and I needed it of specific dimensions. Roan 55G is what Kurt Andrus determined was needed. Now, I originally was going to use 25G for my cross boom. Others have done that. KB8RQ put up four nines on 25G. A number of people have done that. Now that I've been through some weather, I'm thankful I used 55G and I'm thankful Kurt steered us this way. Here's the 55G cross boom that I had modified on the ends to have tie downs for the uh, vertical supports. And in the old days, everybody will remember, this is how you would attach the vertical strut to your cross boom. You would bolt it on the side. Well, I worked with N0TB and he's a good moon bounce guy. He's perfectionist, like good moon bounce people are. And Tim made me believe, you know what? This is a bad idea. I don't care. This is how it's always been done. This is off center. And I understood firsthand the problems of imbalance because on my first EME arrays, um, they were far from properly balanced for, for various reasons. There was no way I could get them. So I made adjustments and I scrapped this plan midway and I went, we're going to change that. We're going to put a plate straight up the middle of the cross boom. Now that's not easy when you're using tower section for cross boom and the spacing has to be at a certain place, but Randy can do anything. So he modified the, the, the cross pieces of the 55G and made it what it needed to be on both ends of the cross boom. All right. Uh, Lightning protection for your control wires. AC data systems is who I use. And I'm kind of going all over the map here with topics. Getting the antennas ready. Uh, I went with V trussing. These are 58 foot long booms. They're long. <clears throat> uh, the first shipment that we received from Kurt Andrus for elevation rotator stuff was the lower plate for the elevation rotator. Here it is. You can see it put onto the top of the three inch mast. In addition, you can see the custom rain boots that Kurt Andrus built to weather protect the bearings. So Kurt's a good details guy and he's a good mechanical guy. I like his work. I'm very happy with it. <clears throat> I also learned from the late KB8RQ the benefit of having a camera in your shack when you're doing EME. When I did my initial raise, I didn't put a camera up and oh my God, running outside and looking at the antenna and running back inside. This is so much nicer. Um, so I currently have a camera on my array and it helps with positional feedback to make sure I'm still on the moon when I think I am. <clears throat> we set the crane in October, 2019 using a crane. I hurried to, uh, I thought quick enough, October of 2019, hand dig trench for placing my cables. I was originally gonna direct bury this, but we have critters that dig underground. And I did not wanna take the chance of having my one and five eighths heliacs get hit by some critter that burrows under the ground. So KB8RQ convinced me, he said, Dave, you gotta put that in some kind of, you know, he said, just use the tile, like the farmers use for drain tile. That's what I did. I pulled that in, I pulled the heliacs into drain tile there may be better ways to do this, but that's what I did. And at least there's some mechanical protection around my cables. 
And then I've got pull ropes in there so that if I ever had to change a cable, hopefully it may be possible without digging up the trench again. <clears throat> November 7th, I just barely got the trench backfilled and winter arrives. Sometimes that happens in Wisconsin. Uh, end of November, I had antennas all ready to go, four of them. You can see the phasing lines are coiled up and ready, so they are ready to go. You can also see the crane ruts on the ground if you look at the bottom of the photo from when the tower was set. That's part of doing a project like this. Okay, the design for the rotator is shown here. Uh, this is all Kurt Andress and, uh, and Paul K7PN. Those are the two gentlemen that did this. Kurt did everything except the rings. Paul did the rings. Together, it made a, I believe, an excellent elevation rotator. <clears throat> the first parts received would be the drive ring that goes around the outside of the 55G. Theoretically, if you remove all outside trusses, you could rotate this thing 360 degrees, right? I mean, theoretically, if you take off all cross boom trusses, this will just keep going and going and going. And you would have to take off all cables, of course, all cables that come into your, to your center connection. But the, there's no restriction on the rotation uh, due to the rotor. That's what I, I, I wanted. Here are the parts in the back of Kurt's truck. Uh, this was N0TB's idea. Um, I was still having a really bad taste in my mouth about my favorite shipping carrier losing pieces that were critical to my system. And Tim offered up this idea. He said, you know, he said, my brother Dean has a new truck. And he said, I got this idea. Tim, you know, Dean and Tim and Ralph, another friend of, of all, all of ours, said we drive out there and go get the stuff. And Tim and I were talking regularly. And we also discovered that Kurt Andrus, he does terrific work. Um, it just helps him with the schedule uh, to show up at a certain deadline. Um, and, and so that was the other thinking behind this drive trip is we set a deadline, we make sure that happens because um, I had already missed three new ones. I wanted to get this stuff on the air, but I also wanted the quality. So you combine all that together, the, the shipping loss of a prior venture, the idea that if we drive and go get it ourselves, we have control over all the parts. Uh, and, and, and Tim offered up you know, him and his brother and Ralph. And, and so that's what we did, a four-day drive trip. I've never gone on a trip this long and wasn't sure my back could handle it, but it really turned out great. And I got to say that that truck that Dean has was incredibly comfortable for a truck. All right, there's us in, uh, gosh, I think that was when we, I don't know, um, somewhere in South Dakota, I think. Uh, okay, here's, oh, and by the way, that's N0TB on the left, uh, me, and then uh, Dean, N9DL in the black shirt, and Ralph in the tan shirt on the right. So those are the important people, those three, and then me. All right, we got stuff back. Now put it together. Here's the brand new, never been seen before, K7 NV rotator. Uh, Tim got one of these, I got one of these. And uh, um, so Tim and I were, were kind of comparing notes and figuring out, you know, Kurt gave us very explicit instructions how to build this. And we videotaped that so that we'd have all that when we got back. Uh, Kurt's a mechanical engineer. He's really good at this stuff. He got it right. Um, we're very happy with these systems. Then build the H-frame, build the vertical struts. I used three and a half inch pipe at the centers down to three inch at the tips. And then I trussed everything in two directions with Philistran. Uh, I've got 6,700 Philly across the cross boom, 4,000 Philly on the vertical struts. Um, and then putting it up, here's the bottom two Yagis. We put those up one day. And then the top two Yagis, we put those up in, in August. And finally, we're on the air in August of uh, 2020. So this is when the array is finally uh, underway. N0TB has another um, uh, extreme passion. He's a great photographer and he's interested in drones. So he gets this really cool drone, brings it over and said, you know, we could get some neat pictures of stuff these are compliments of N0TB. He, he and his drone shot these pics, which I think are fantastic, during the fall colors. Then I started having problems hearing. 
noise is the suspect. So I built a little antenna, went noise hunting, and, I, and that's a continual effort. Those of you that do EME, you know the routine. Um, severe noise. I'm still working on that issue. It's gotten better, but I'm still working that. Uh, here's one of the sources, an old transformer got replaced. That also caused me to reevaluate my feed point chokes. I updated those to this. Okay, that's what I then tried next. Guess what? There's another story there. I'll give you the executive summary of that story. There turned out to be quality problems with the crimped on connectors I used for these. So guess what? These are all scrapped now too, and I'm currently redoing these. Uh, I'm still learning things in this EME game. I'm learning uh, lots. Oh, then July 28th this year, my array was nine days short of its first birthday. It was not quite up one year, and we got one of these in the middle of the night. Interesting, because when I was designing my array, I would comment routinely, you know what, as long as we don't get a tornado, this array is going to be fine. I guess I shouldn't have said that. We measured a 94 mile an hour wind, 94.1. You can see it on my weather station right there. That was EF1 tornadoes. Now I know our friends in Texas are going, that's a small one. I know. But for me, it was big and hurtful. It destroyed my LFA-10. You can see that on the top of the 90 foot tower on the top right. And it broke one of my EME uh, antennas. Um, it also severely bent the other top Yagi. Um, so I've been repairing things and I'm still working to repair things, but it's getting close to ready to go again. And um, it's operational, it's just not quite back to where I want it. So, all right, um, these kind of projects require incredible work. These people offered extra special significant help to me in my journey building stuff. W7GJ, the Energizer Bunny, G0KSC Justin, Antenna Design, Lionel, V7BQH, Kurt Andrus, our rotor guy, K7PN Rotors, N0TB, support, partnership, generous help, drives over from Minnesota at times too to help. His brother Dean, N9DL, who's from Beloit, Wisconsin. Uh, Ralph, N9BDR, also a friend. Uh, N9IW, Tim, also very helpful. By the way, Tim did an internship when he was doing his double E at the Andrew Corporation. Heliacs, folks. He's got great perspective on Heliac stuff. N2EME, Paul, lots of help that I needed setting up SDR console. Ray, WA4NJP, was a huge help um, when I had amplifier problems and tried to, you know, and, and so was Lance, trying to figure out how to get that amp working. That was super helpful. N1DG, Don with his helpful connections with uh, <laughs> my friends at my favorite shipping company. Um, Randy Pascula, custom fabricator, can build anything. Uh, wow, the list of people, and I feel bad because this list is big and I go, there are other people that helped me also. And it's like, the list is so big. You cannot underestimate how huge an EME project is till you go through it. But I am so grateful and thankful to the help from everybody uh, on this list and others also. Finally, I... I documented the sources where I got different things. So uh, antennas, uh, VE7BQH stuff, W7GJ, the, uh, the, the, he has great information on his website on all topics, how things are built. Again, my power divider design was Lance's design. A uh, number of the ideas he helped with. Uh, the rotor stuff at K7NV, the rotor controllers, the machining, Pascula's, and N0TB with the drone photography stuff. So. Okay, all right, looks like we came in pretty close to on schedule. I'm open for questions. Well, first, let me say that that was just an awesome um, presentation. And um, I certainly didn't appreciate, you know, just how complex and how much effort in planning, project management, as you said, goes into uh, something like this. And, and it was great that you rolled the credits and talked about uh, um, uh, all of your friends who uh, 
pitched in to uh, make this a great success. So that that's just wonderful. So do we have questions for David? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, what is the highest elevation if you're tracking the moon? How far up do you have to point? Well, it depends, Lloyd. It, it, the array goes up to 90 degrees and farther. Uh, I have not operated past probably 65 degrees so far, but I also need to tell you, I had been working multiple jobs and my on the air time was extremely limited. So I haven't been on the air as much as, as, as some others have, uh, but it'll go up as high as 88, you know, um, at times, certain times of the year. So it, and then there's certain times of where the moon is. So it depends. Okay, the reason I ask, I, I doubt that I'll ever do a four, L, uh, a four antenna array, but I may try a single antenna and I'm wondering just how, how much elevation I need to uh, design into my uh, plan. And you said 60 something degrees? You know, as much as you can get is really the answer there. And it depends what you wanna work. Uh, K6QXY, really did some innovative things with this idea to, to, to try to answer your question better than even I could. He basically, instead of rotating his entire like four by something array in azimuth and elevation, he hangs a 45 G tower like this from a, from a vertical other tower. And then he puts two high by four wide six meter Yagi's fixed at a point in the sky. And he can move that arm with all these Yagi's around so what he does is he points it at a spot in the sky where the moon is gonna be passing across. And then he makes a schedule with somebody like in Europe during that time. He talk about a brilliant idea. He does not necessarily have full ASL control real time, but you talk about a great way to get some serious gain where you need it. That's an idea that I wanted to mention. Uh, now K6QXY I think had some unfortunate luck with the whole California fires thing, but he had that beautiful system on 45G and it was too high by four wide. I think it was five or six element Yagi's. Really innovative way to do that. I hope that helps give you some, some insight, but the more elevation you can get the better, but there's other- yeah, the, Once you start getting into the upper elevations, it mechanically gets to be a real problem because the antenna is banging against the support structure. And you got to have a minimum boom length, otherwise it doesn't pay to elevate. I mean, if you're not in a certain, uh, and there's various views on what, Lance W7GJ has great material on kind of a minimum system on his website. By the way, I hope Lance won't mind. His website is bigskyspaces.com slash W7GJ. And I've got it uh, listed on my, I think I got it listed on my, uh, uh, on, the, on the sources on the back here. Um, so, uh, I'm just looking. Yes, Big Sky Spaces is on the array uh, on that on that uh, on there. So, um, the more the better, Lloyd. I mean, that's really the bottom line. Um, you know what? It might be easier to elevate four sixes or four sevens than one long Yagi. I mean, a number of people have done that and found it easier. It, it just from a it, it, there are trade offs here and and mechanical, electrical. You're, this is a multidisciplinary pursuit. It's um, Four, four fives or four sixes probably be a lot easier. Mm. And you can balance it. You can, you know, you can really control it. And uh, that I think would be a first look that I would make. Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other questions on any aspect of things? So what, what elevation do you usually, the low elevation do you usually um, start out with? What? Uh, what's your horizon look like? Uh, you know what? W7GJ could probably, he's seen my, my single Yagi before the EME array. I could play down to zero and maybe 0.1 or 0.2 degrees below that. I'm up on a kind of a hill. That's actually probably bad for EME, but it was really good for that single terrestrial Yagi. Uh, I'll play all the way down to zero. I don't really consider that I have much negative horizon here, but, uh, but, from zero up works great. Other questions on any? Yeah, Dave, have you been able to completely uh, eliminate your noise out there? 
Oh, hi, Ken. Uh, good to see you. Yeah, late start well, here today. <laughs> not completely. Uh, the transformer problem is solved. The power company is working on another line noise, I believe, issue to myself. And of mm. course, that's right underneath where I need to aim when the moon's going across the sky. But they are working on it. I'm in communication with their supervisor, Jim Jesse. And so he's working that. Um, and just recently, I found some other things that I'm learning about Heliax connectors. My, um, my RPC oh. Heliax connectors, I'm finding, I had them nice and tight a year ago when I put things up. When I'm quality checking here, working on my phasing cables, one of my Heliax connectors, I could actually by hand with gentle force turn it. That's okay. obviously a bad problem. So I, I've had nothing but trouble with those RPC connectors. They're garbage. Uh, they become high resistance. And yep. Uh, yep. the only good thing about them is the tower climbers love them because they're super easy to install. Yeah, well, you're right. Uh, on the same thing and my four are getting replaced i'm i i, I talked to my my andrew buddy and those are going in the trash because i have when i first put up this array it was here and really well and i would say after the first month or two i have been unhappy with how this array is hearing based on how it should play given the the hardware that's up so i think i finally found what's wrong and i'm fixing it so um, well, yeah. if, if, if you wish, I still have all this equipment here. And after the knee replacement, I've actually gotten back to relatively ambulatory now. So thank you, Ken. Uh, I'm, I'm walking. Let me know. I'm glad to hear that you're doing well. I'm going to take you yep. up on that because signal to noise ratio, when I teach my communications class, that's what we drill on. What's funny is I had to hear it again just to think about it and get it in my own system. So yeah, SNR is what we're going after. Thank and, you. And if you're if you're worried about injecting signals onto cables, I have the standard EM, uh, EMC equipment that is used to run that test, i.e., uh, signal generator, power amplifier, and those donut uh, clamp-on donut clamps. I have all that stuff. So thank you. You know, I've been reading Canine YC's material. Shucks, I didn't put him in my references. Canine yeah. Charlie, that guy understands noise and how to kill noise. Um, uh, he he has a, a, a number of articles that go about, what, 50 pages that talk about killing received noise. Google them. Um, read that material. For those of you that are that are interested in hearing weak signals, his material is um, awesome, and I'm still learning from stuff. Every time I read his stuff, I find something new. And Ken, thank you. Yes, I do want to do some more measuring because theory says I still got issues. I want to knock down the noise, so thank you. We'll do it, and it'll be fun. Other questions so far? Uh, David, what was the motivation to change from two meters to six meters? What was, I'm sorry, what was the... Extreme. What was the motivation? Why did you change? Okay. Well, Ken Boston, the guy that was just asking the question, is the guy that got me into moon bounce in the first place. So he, the, the reason I picked two meters first time is I'm a DXer and I want to work DX. I really, no offense to all my stateside friends, but I, grids don't do it for me. It's just, that is not exciting to me. Countries are exciting to me. So I talked to Ken and I said, Ken, what band do I get on? And he said, because I wanted to work DXCC on whatever band I chose EME. And Ken said, two meters, that's where it's at. So I put up a, a eight Yagi array. I spent about five years on two meters, hitting it really hard. Almost all of that was on CW. At the very tail end, there was some JT44, uh, but that was why I did two meters. Now, why did I do six? Um, there's only one way you can work some of these stations like KG6DX. Well, unless you can sit home all the time 24 seven and wait for a sporadic E opening. But a lot of these other places, the moon is your friend as a reflector to help you connect with those. So for six meters, it's essential to have that as a oh, propagation mode. And, and Lance is the, the pioneer that really discovered this and, and promotes this tirelessly. This is his good idea. I'm just, I'm just getting on the bandwagon. That's all. Okay. 
And we have we, we have Lance's uh, presentation, so um, people may want to go back uh, uh, now and listen to uh, uh, his presentation on six meter propagation and EME stuff. That was, I think it was maybe about a year or so ago that he did that presentation. So that's on our YouTube channel. I'm going to stop the recording.